Amen. All right. First Timothy. Second Timothy, excuse me. Second Timothy chapter one. I was going to sing happy birthday to that kid. We can do it after. Okay. Yes, <laughs> All right, well, we still have Rose, so let's sing. A happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rose. Happy birthday to you. Amen. She's trying to hide the whole time, you know. That's your birthday? Huh? No, we just started singing for no reason. Okay. Uh actually when is it, Rose? Today? Is it today actually? It's the thirteenth. Okay, so it's not just today, it's today's the ninth. Thank She's in a few days, so we're singing on credit. <laughs> I'll accept it. <laughs> okay. Go over to Second Timothy chapter one. And um Let's stand for the reading. It's in verse number, uh, we're going to look at verse number five today. Uh, this is written to Timothy by Paul, who's trying to help him in the ministry. And he gives him an ex exhortation in the very beginning. And the Bible says that he said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt, that means permanently, first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Father, bless thy word today, Lord, and we love you. We thank you for the mothers today, Lord Father. I thank you for my mom. I thank you, Lord, you set this all up uh, so that we would get to know you. And I thank you for all you do, Lord. Help me today. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, let's have a seat and we'll go over and he says, that's the, uh, the legacy of a, of a mom. What's that? Well, I, I mean, one of the greatest things that a mother could do would be uh, to lead their child and have a faith that their child would see for them to come to Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I think of some of the mothers I've seen in time. I think of uh, some good moms. And Yvonne, she's always been a good mom. I watch her with her kids. I have uh, yet not to see Yvonne on a, a Wednesday night uh, come in with concerns about her children and their walk or unwalk with the Lord. I've watched her for nine years. I've watched her, I've watched her in nine years. I've watched her cry. I've watched her uh, about her kids. I've watched her cry for her grandkids. I've watched her uh, beg God for her great-grandkids. Uh, that's the unfeigned faith that I've seen in her over the last nine years. And look at how many is here. <laughs> Actually, if you didn't realize, two years ago, two years ago on an Easter, she filled this place up with about 30 so people, if you remember. Her family all came in here. Okay, so don't think it was in vain. They all were preached to. She has seen a lot of her family get saved. And although she looks at it in a timely fashion of the present, she needs to sometimes look at the long term of, of it all. Maybe they ain't in the church house and maybe they ain't always sanctified. But they'll be in the Lord's house sooner or later. Amen. 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 So um, a mother can make all the difference in the world. Okay, uh, I see sometimes uh, some mothers that make a difference. Uh, uh, Miss Adrian, you make a difference. Amen. You made a lot of difference. Why is that? Well, Adrian was the first one that came in, uh, although she came in because maybe somebody else or whatever. But the day she came in here, uh, she was up by herself at first. And but then after that, she brought in her daughters. Why? The unfeigned faith. The unfeigned faith that she saw. And where did she get it? Well, maybe she got it as a kid. Maybe she got it from somewhere else. But I'll tell you what, where she really got it was out in a cemetery on the, on the grounds out there in her, in her father's apartment. That's where she got it. What she got was she heard something she had never heard before. She saw a miracle happen inside of her father's house. Amen. And then she, she kept with that miracle and she defied everybody in her house because she knew the Lord was tugging at her strings and at her father's funeral, she saw a lot of her family get saved that day. Yeah. You can't argue with that type of faith. Amen? Yeah. 
Amen. Watched much faith in time. I've watched people in here with uh, unfeigned faith and in and, and, and dealing with um, things in their life. And, and there's examples in the Bible that we can go by to look at those faith. If you would, turn to 1 Samuel and write in the first chapter. And we're going to talk about a mother's faith. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel, in the very beginning of the chapter, uh, now there was a certain man of uh, Ramothim and Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkina, the son of Jerom, Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, uh, the son of Zuth, and Ephrodite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, which means grace. And the other was uh, Penina. Uh, and Penina had children, but Hannah, she had no children. She had no children. At verse number four, and, and when the time was that Elkina offered, he gave to Penina, uh, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. Why? For he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Did you notice what it just said? The Lord had done what? That, now who, who opens the womb then? Not doctors. Not fertility drugs. The Lord does. You know, people would be a little better if they just get down on their hands and knees and ask God to give them children instead of, instead of asking doctors. It says right there, it's the Lord that opens up the womb. It's not the doctor that's opened up the womb. It's, you want to conceive, go to the Lord if you're having problems, okay? It was the Lord that did it. And now watch, and it says in verse number six, and her adversary, now isn't that something? Calls the other woman what? Her adversary. Who's your real adversary? We, 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 we fight not against uh, flesh and blood, but against powers. Powers is what we go against. But it says here, it says, uh, and her adversary also provoked her sore. She probably uh, has has a, a bad spirit in her. Uh, for to make her fret. Why is that? Because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she she so she provoked her. She uh, Therefore she wept and, and did not eat. She, you know, depression can cause you to have an eating problem. How do you know? Well, the book just told you that. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the problems you, that uh, cause you to do things and cause you to have these problems are usually something inside of you and they need to be worked out usually by what else is inside of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's what the Bible says here. Um, now look at verse number 8. It says, Then Elkina, that's her husband, to, says to her, uh, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am, I, am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had dr drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon the seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore, and she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, when I will give him unto the Lord, then I will give him unto the Lord, all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon uh, his head. And now you got to think about this is one humble woman. I mean, she goes right to the Lord and asks him for a man child, but you know, she does it like in a different way. You know what she says? She makes a commitment and vows a vow. Now the Lord says, don't vow a vow unless you're going to pay. I want you to understand something. There's some people in here who made vows. Brian made a vow. He made a vow to his wife. She made a vow to him. You know what God says? Paid a vow. How long? Well, until you're both alive. Amen. Isn't that what he said? What God put us what God put together? Let no man put us under. You say, did God put them together? Well, they're here now. Whether or not.
whether, whether or not what happened has nothing to do with it, now they're here. And they're together. Amen? Amen. So if something was to happen, what are we supposed to do? Well, me, I can tell you what I do. I go to their house and I say, hey, let's get this together again, okay? You know, I know they're not going to do anything. Plus, I don't want to keep Brian in a headlock for over an hour. You know, until he submits or something like that because he's bullheaded. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Amen? Amen. All right? So, uh, but anyway, she vows a vow. Now, there's some things to this with her humbleness. And she turns around and she says that. Uh, she vows a vow. And she says, give me a man child and I'll give him back. All the days of your, all the days of his life. Okay, she's going to raise that kid to go work uh, at the, uh, basically at the church or at the temple. But she adds something and she says, and no razor would come upon his head. Now, does anybody know where that comes from? I'll go to Numbers chapter six. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. In Numbers chapter 6, the Bible says, now look over in Numbers 6, and we'll start right in the very beginning. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. And he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dry. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, uh, from the kernel even to the husk. Verse 5, all the days of the vow, of his separation, there shall what? No razor come upon his head. What's that? He's a Nazarite. She turned around and she gave a vow and took a vow of a Nazarite. Now, uh, there was another guy in the Bible that took a vow of a Nazarite, and that was a man by the name of Samson. You remember a guy named Samson? Now, Samson had a different problem. His problem was women, amen? And couldn't keep his hands off women. And uh, But... He lost his hair because of a woman. A razor came to his head because of a woman. Now, you'll notice one thing about Samuel. You can read from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, and you'll find out one thing. Number one, you'll never find him drinking any liquor, and you'll never find him with a shaven head. He kept that vow his whole life, not like Samson. That's a good mother. You say, why? That was the kid. No, that was the mother who prayed for that child when he was young. Amen. The Bible says here, and going back to uh, uh, go back to First uh, Samuel chapter one. She was praying, and she said she gave a vow to the Lord. And, and at verse number twelve, it says, and it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli, he's the high priest. It says that Eli did what? He marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake where? In her heart. heart. Hannah was speaking in her heart. What does that tell you? She's not speaking out loud. She's saying it inside. Okay? And her confusion and her problems and her struggles were where? Inside. She spoke inside. Hey, how many of you pray and really don't realize you're speaking inside yourself? Now, there's two things that can happen. Number one, you can speak to yourself inside yourself and you can... You can conjure up all the craziness there is. Just so you know, you can be your worst enemy by speaking inside your heart. And the reason why is because the heart is despicable in all its ways. Who can know it? It deceives you. Uh, you hear women, they walk around, girls, actually young girls, and they say things like, uh, I, keep my, I live by my heart, I keep my heart on a sleeve. Well, you better put it back in. Why? Because that heart, you need to protect it because it's deceitful. How do you know? Well, how many times I heard a woman say, well, a girl say, oh, she loves this guy. And she really doesn't even know the guy. They're emotional and they start to speaking of these things and their heart can actually be their greatest enemy in that way. And uh, here she speaks inside of her heart, but look how she speaks. It says, 
She spake inside her heart, only her lips moved. How many of you have seen that one and had that one? Where you're praying inside and your lips are moving, but nothing's coming out. It may be the most important prayer you'll ever pray. Amen. It says here, it says, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Now watch. Therefore, Eli, now he's the high priest, isn't he? And what does he think? He thinks she had been drunk. He thinks she's drinking alcohol. And look what he says. He says, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Put the bottle down, woman. You must be drunk walking around speaking to yourself. You see, you know what the problem is? The problem there is with Eli. You know what Eli needed? He needed a good rebuke because he doesn't even know when his people are praying. He doesn't even realize if she had a problem or not. Why? He wasn't looking to his flock to see. You see? He should have known this right away. So, uh, Eli says this to her. Yeah, you better put the bottle away. Okay? Eli has the heart that is not right. Uh, it says, and Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman with a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. What is the Lord looking for? He's looking for your heart, isn't he? When the Bible says that the, that the Lord, he says he looks on the heart of a man, not on the appearance of a man. It's on the heart. What was Eli looking at? He was looking at the appearance of her. He, she appears to be a drunk because she's talking to herself. I mean, I've seen drunks before. I've been a drunk before. So I know how a drunk acts. I know what a drunk does. Okay? And somebody standing there in the middle of the temple, that's a drunk? Something's wrong with Eli. Now watch. She says in verse number 16, she says, Count not thine hand made for a daughter of what? Belial. Yeah. You've seen that so many times in the Bible, haven't you, Miss Adrian? Mm -hmm. The sons of Belial. And you go, what is a son of Belial? Well, it's a drunk. <laughs> Did you just see it? It's a drunk. That's how you know what a son of Belial is. He's a drunk. Okay? Why? Because she thought, I'm not one of these daughters of Belial. What's that? I'm not a drunkard. He claimed she was drunk. Okay? Uh, Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and my and grief have I spoken thereto. I'm upset. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. He, he gets his rebuke inside. He was ashamed. So he says, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. He, he, he wants to try and atone for himself. And she said, and she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the handmaid went her way and, and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Why? She poured it out to the Lord. It's his decision now. You see? What, well, sometimes you've got to understand something. You have a problem. You've got to get rid of some of your problems. Uh, some of these things that you, you hold dear to you, just so you know, your problems are usually, they're your problems until you can hand them over. You need to hand some of your problems over to the Lord. That's one of the biggest things I see in the church house is your problems are greatly in faith when you can't solve them. But the moment they, they seem to be in your grasp, you forget about God. Why? Well, you've got experience. You did it before. God, get in the back seat. I got this. And you start driving, not realizing you're driving from where God had you. And you're driving a bad path. You see, your faith is great in deep water. But it's not when it gets shallow. You see, you like to take over and you like to have your own lifeboat. And you run the lifeboat instead of staying in the ship with God. Amen? I've seen it countless times, people. Okay, so uh, they rose up. Look at verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And now watch, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord did what? Remembered her. He remembered her. Wouldn't you like to be remembered? Lord Amen. was the prayer of the thief. Lord, do what? Remember me. And the Lord remembered him. And the Lord remembered 
Anna. You don't think the, the mother's faith means something? Well, it does right there. Why? Because the child was not even there yet, and the Lord remembered her what she Amen. asked for. Amen. Amen. Wherefore, it came to pass, when the time was come after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel. She calls his name Samuel. And this is why he's called Samuel. Why did you name him Sam Samuel? Because I have asked him of the Lord. That's her vow, is Samuel. I've asked him. Who did you ask for? I asked him of the Lord. You know who, you know who we have a child in here was, I know was asked of the Lord. That little boy that runs around here, Caleb, he was a boy that was asked of from the Lord. I, I know that was there because I happened to be there a few times when that child was asked for of the Lord. That's the for that family, in a way, they could use that child to say that's the child of promise. I've been asking for that child when he was conceived. I've been asking for that, not when he was, but after. I, I, when I knew that she was pregnant, I started praying for that child to be a, a pastor or a missionary Amen. or a man. Of, somewhere he needs to be a man of God. Amen. I've been praying for that child since. I pray for all the children that have ever come in here. And, and many of them I still pray for even though they're gone. Okay, uh, verse number uh, 21, and, and the man Elkine and all his house went up to, the, to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. She's getting the child ready. I mean, that child has been basked in prayer before the child came. The child is best, uh, is, is full with prayer uh, after the child is born. And she says, I'm going to keep this child and, and keep nurture this child because when I finally get up to that temple, I have a vow. I have a vow. Let's keep going. Verse number 23. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, uh, do what seemeth good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. With three bullocks and one ephah of flour and one bottle of wine. And brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee there, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, also, I have, what's that say? I have lent him. Look what it says. I have lent him to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Now, uh, she turns around and she says, here it is. I got this from the Lord. I prayed for this. I got this from the Lord. I told the Lord I'd bring this child up to be of the Lord. And she comes up and she does what? She pays her vow. Here, Lord, I lend her to him. Do you realize she had a lot of kids after that? You know why she had a lot of kids? Because God pays better interest than your bank. Yeah. He doesn't just give her the child back. She always has a child. She lends them to the Lord, Lent. And the interest she gets back from the Lord is more children. And she's got, becomes a very, she becomes a very blessed life. Uh, Samuel grows up in the church, but it's that mother. It's that mother. As her, it's the prayers of that mother. Uh, you don't think a mother can make a difference? Yeah. It makes a whole lot of difference in prayer. You see, you see, you go through your life and you pray, and sometimes you don't even see those prayers. But you have no idea what's happening and what the Lord is doing. I want you to understand something. I have I have kids, and my kids aren't. Uh, they're not in church all the time. They're not in church. Actually, I got one that won't even go in. But she's saved. And I still pray for her every day. I have this hope and this dream that one day she walked through. 
and she would stay in the house of God. Amen. I have that prayer, and I have that. I keep it going, and I keep moving on that prayer, and I still pray for them, and I still pray for them to keep to come. Please come, please come. And even though I may think I'm, I may be disappointed in some way, I know one thing. Sooner or later, uh, God, the world may have my kids now, but let me tell you something. God will have them for a thousand years during the millennium amen, to teach amen. those children. And that's what I am looking forward to, amen. that my children will be with the Lord. Now, I would love to have my children in church. I would love to have them have a relationship with God. I would love them to grow up like that. Let me tell you something. You want protection of your kids. You can go buy all the guns you want, but let me tell you something. It's in here they get the most protection of all time because they're going to learn what's called truth. You can't yeah. learn truth in a school. They don't teach truth in a school. They teach kids fables. They teach kids stories and tell them their truth. Imagine some kid that is so young like him, and they're in their kindergarten, and the first thing they talk, start to tell them is things like, the world is, that their earth is, is heating up and, and, and it's going to go away and it's going to die. And they speak to the child. I mean, i got to tell you something. I, I look at these schools today and I hear them on uh, people who, uh, who have the teachers now on this uh, virtual thing. Listening to the teachers, I feel like the kids are in a funeral. <laughs> because they're not teaching the kids. There's no, there's no edifying the children. There's no building the children up. It's tearing them down and tearing them down. And all they want to do is separate the kids to think racism, to think all kinds of other things. Hey, let me tell you something, people. Uh, the, the biggest racists I have ever met are the ones who bring it up all the time. Amen? Amen. If you are not, hey, look, however we got here, I could care less. We are here now, and we're all one people. Yes. We should act like one people. Let me tell you something. If you want to, you want the kids to fail, be like the teachers over here. Call the kids losers all the time. You say, they're not calling them losers. They are in their speeches. They are losing it all. You guys are running into this systemic racism. You guys are doing this and you guys, and the whole planet is dying. Yeah. Why would you go to a place like that? <laughs> and they're going to make it better. How they do it? By their unlogical logic. I don't want to preach about it. <laughs> Teachers are idiots. That's why they got that's why it doesn't take much to be one. They got a very uh, minute education, you know, but act like they know everything. That always killed me about them. Uh, guys go to go to medical school, guys go to science and everything else and then they go into school and the teacher says how smart they are. <laughs> and they have the actual we I went to a teacher's college so I know their degree people. Just so you know, I went to a teacher's college. All my friends went to be teachers. The only reason I went to that school was because I could do better in sports there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I became an officer out of the school and got out of there. Amen. <laughs> but uh, I will tell you, uh, I will tell you, I'm not a very big fan of the education system we have in this country. Um, right now, I think it's better to... to uh, homeschool the kids because they uh, they home they get a controlled environment with yes. things. Whether you do it or whether you're not, that's up to you. Hey, look, I know I went to a public school system. It, don't let your kids get indoctrinated. No. That's the biggest thing. And when the teachers are indoctrinating them, say something to the teacher. Amen. My, I don't want my child to learn that junk. Okay? Uh, when your kids go home and they're learning about evolution, make sure you tell your kids the teacher is telling them a story. It's not truth. Amen. 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 Why? Uh, because you want your kids to know the Lord. How are they going to know the Lord from a school these days? Amen. We just had a president pray last week. Just so you know, the president prayed last week, and uh, he, he didn't even have God in his prayer. And one of the people asked, who, who are you praying to? <laughs> I mean, think about it, people. The president of the United States has to make these grave decisions, and he prays to a nothing. He doesn't have anything to say. He's saying words out loud. Basically, he's saying words into the air and saying nothing that means anything because he had nobody to say it to. That's kind of like saying that that's like telling a joke, people, yeah. because that's what it becomes. It becomes a joke, and that's what he is. He's a big a joke. Amen. Amen. All right? So, but here's a mother. Here's a mother. Hannah's a 
How does a mom who prepares way ahead of time? And she says, she begs the Lord for something. And the Lord grants her her request. And know what she does? She says, now that the Lord has given her my request, I'll give him back to her. Amen. I think they're great. We have people, they, uh, they come up. I've had people come up to me and ask me they want to dedicate their children. You know what I always say to them? When are you going to dedicate yourself? Yeah. <laughs> what good is dedicating your children when you won't even dedicate yourself? Your children will grow up in some way of you. Usually, we know the system because with the way things work, when somebody's, uh, uh, their children are usually not as, as good as the adults, as who came before them. We want them to be, but it doesn't always work that way. Why? Because everything is going down, you see. That's why it has to be bathed in prayer. You're not going to find today all the faith that was in the parents uh, that are in the children these days as much. And the reason why, if the parent doesn't have faith, they're not bringing the child to faith. You see? And when they and, and, and the children that are not brought up in faith will not usually bring the child. The child will not see it. Today that's the problem. Look at the church house today. I mean, I had a guy say to me one day, how many he said to me, just as a thing, I said, How many people you have in your church? I said, Well, I never really counted the numbers. I want the quality. And he said, You you better realize uh, this, and that is that uh if they're not in there, the parents aren't in there, how, how are they, how are the kids going to get in there? Seriously. They'll never be convenient with them, and when they come in, they won't like it at all. Get them acquainted with it. Why? Because you want them to stay in it. Uh, the Bible says train up a child in the way uh, it should go. The child should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Amen. Amen. The Bible has instructions for how to bring up children. Uh, uh, just so you know, I didn't know the instructions the whole time. But when I, once I did, guess what? Then I wanted to do it. I wanted it there. Okay? What's more important? Hey, look, I don't like this, I don't like that. Hey, look, you know what most of the people have? Uh, most parents have what we call a conviction. Amen? And with that conviction, usually... If the parent doesn't like it, guess what? The child isn't going to like it either. You see? Get your child used to it. Get your child to pray with you. Uh, put your child on their knees to learn how to get close to God. Look, the way to God is not up. It's down. You know, the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? Teach us to pray. What do you think your children should learn? Teach them to pray. Why? What's your biggest problem? Prayer. Amen? Amen? Prayer is always going to be your biggest problem. Why won't you do something to solve that problem in your children? Amen. Teach them to pray. And they won't have a problem with prayer as they get older. Show them the importance of prayer. Walk around your house. You see this right here? I This became because of prayer. Amen. This this person over here, my mom got saved. You know why my mom got saved? Prayer. And God's being faithful to his word through prayer. Okay, people, uh, I got to tell you, my mom for years, she took me to a church when I was a little kid. We actually got went to two churches. I went to Presbyterian church every Sunday during the day. And then I went to the Greek church whenever they had anything. My mom, I guess she thought, this kid's so bad, i got to double to him. <laughs> now, they didn't teach salvation, but at least she took me somewhere. And that was what kind of like the schoolmaster that brought me to Jesus Christ when I got older. And I started to ask around, and I started to say, well, is this all there? People, I, I didn't knew there was a God back, in, back when I was young. I just didn't know him. He was just God that created the universe to me. But he wasn't, he wasn't, just wasn't my friend. And I didn't know him that way. But she took me there. Hey, look, that woman took me to Sunday school, man. She made sure every week, me and my sisters were in Sunday school. When we moved somewhere else and it was too far to get there, you know what? We went to the church up the road. And she didn't know the difference between Lutheran, Presbyterian, or anything. 
She just made sure we were in church on the weekend. And then finally, somebody came to me and said, you want to know this God? And finally, I said, yeah, I want to know this God. So I went to that church and nothing happened. It was years later when I got saved. And I realized, I thought, my, man, these, everybody's saved, not me, but my mom wasn't saved. And I used to go every week and I used to turn around, I used to put arrows, I used to make these big arrows. And I used to point them to one verse and I used to say, Mom, read that verse. And it would be a verse that would say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I used to keep saying to my mom, It's by faith, it's by faith, it's by faith. It's not by works, it's by faith. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and she she would just faint away. And I would beg God, and I would cry, and I would walk around, and I'd actually say, you know, she means something to me. This was the woman when I had a 104 degree temperature that took alcohol swabs and she wiped me with them. This was the woman when I came home. I was a I was a little kid with a smart mouth, and I would come home and I'd I'd, I'd be beat up, and uh, and my mom would bring me in the house and she would love on me and then she would turn around and tell my dad he needs to learn how to fight <laughs> and then I'd have to learn how to fight my dad used to say it like this you go out there boy and you fight and don't come home losing you got to you make sure you're in and you fight and then my, but my mom would nurture me through these all these times when I got older you know your old way, you know. Uh, a, a mother can actually, you can go up a mom and beg her, mom, don't say nothing to daddy. You know, I know what this goes. And what does the mother do? She has a tendency. You know why she has it? Because she loves you. And, 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 and her heart pours out to you. Okay? I, I dealt with that for years with my mom. My mom never wanted to see me go down. When I, when I left, uh, I never left, I never really left home until the army. I never went anywhere. Always with my family. I went to Florida, but it was always family. When I left for the army, I'll never forget, man. I was standing down in my basement, and they were taking my stuff away, and uh, I was putting it up on a, I was putting it, and they were moving me and stuff like that, and I was realizing that I was leaving, and I'm never looking back, and I just see her face, and I just saw the tears coming down. And I just stood there, and I said, man, I don't want to leave. And I started weeping to my, I, I walked over and I just put my head on my mom's shoulder and I weeped and I said, Mom, Mom, I, thank you. Thank you. At the end of my mom's life, it was like the week before, I mean, i never forget, man. We were up in the, uh, I, I came in and drove down from here and it was October 12th. And I went in to see my mom in, in the hospital and and my mom, I knew what was going on. I knew it was the end. And I went in there to see her. And I sat there. I, I didn't know. I didn't sit down. I actually just stood there. I didn't know what to say. And my mom turns around at me and she says, Son, it's okay to cry for me. I said, I, and I looked at her. I said, Mom, do you understand? She goes, Kirk, I'm going to die. She goes, but I... I don't want you to die with me. You're going to go on. And I called up my mom's preacher that's that year because my mom had gotten right with the Lord. And I called up her preacher and I said, my mom's dying. He said, okay. So he came up and we had a revival right inside of her hospital room. I had two preachers in there and they were preaching. And there was people coming in from the other rooms. The nurses came in. Inside my mom's hospital room. My sisters were there. Other people were there. And it was like a revival right inside the room. And then finally, we got my mother on the hospice and we brought her home. And you know, my mom's life had been changed. And, and I'll never forget sitting there and we were putting on music and my sister was saying, Well, she used to like Elvis. She used to like Elvis. And my mother's sitting there saying, Put on old rugged cross. Amen. Never heard that from my mom. And, and, and I put on, I started putting on hymns and my mom started listening to them. And my mom would turn around and she'd say to me, she'd roll over in the morning and she'd look right, right in the face and she'd say, Kirk, I'd say, what, mom? She'd go, tell me about Jesus. Amen. Tell me about Jesus. And we went on for a couple weeks and I tell you, my mom just wanted to go and she said to me, I can't wait to get out of here. 
Most people would think she would be waiting to try and stay alive. And my mother was like, I just want to see Jesus. Amen. And I got to a, we got to the point where her, 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 she was changing. She was, we knew what was going on. She was starting to forget. She forget things because it was getting to her brain. And it was still my mom. You see, you got to understand something, people. When it comes time to the end, and although there are physical things that may happen and they start to forget, it's just age. You don't remember how they are. You remember who they were. You see? Look, <clears throat> there may come a time where you're gonna, you, you may get to that point. And know what's going to happen? Your kids get all scared because of the things that are coming out of you. And you're saying these things, but... They need to understand something. It's not who they are right there from physical damage. It's who was inside for longevity and who's there. I remember you when you were younger, when your facilities were there, and you were just beautiful, and you're still beautiful inside. It's like if for me and my wife. My wife may have signs. It may, may come a time where she doesn't remember things. It may come a time where she may have Alzheimer's or she may have dementia. Let me tell you something. I've heard guys turn around and put, I, my wife is going nowhere. Into no nursing home, no nothing. She's going to be right with me. And you know what? I'm going to walk her down the road and people are going to say to me, why do you keep doing it? She doesn't even know who you are. Maybe she doesn't, but I know who she is. She's the one that raised our children. Deanna is the one that took care of me. And sometimes she even mothered me through many situations where I needed it. Yeah, God knows who she is, so I know who she is. Amen. And that's my girl. Amen. And that's where I love her. I go to when I every night I go to bed, I look over at my wife and I, I just touch her. Amen. And I always say, How beautiful, you you're mine. Amen. Every night I say that to my wife. I look at her and I say, you know something, honey? We got a conversation that nobody's ever heard. Amen. And she's that special to me. Amen. I always look at people and they see, I, I, I envy sometimes, Roxanne, you have your mom. And, and I wish my mom was here. But my mom was at the last moment. I mean, she didn't know this and she didn't know that and she couldn't remember this, but I can tell you this right now. Right at the end, she, she turned around and, and I, I'll never forget, I held her right with my hand. It was her neck. The back of her neck was in my hands. My sisters were here and here and we were talking to my mom and I all I could say, I knew it was done. I only had minutes and I didn't know what to say and, and I looked her right in the eyes and I said, thank you. You were really good to me. She really was. She was so great to me. All her life comforting me and loving me. And I was able to just look at her and, and just say, thank you, Mom. She was a good mom. She finished her course. And then when she left, she went home to God. I had just baptized her no more than two months ago in the bathtub in her house just so she could feel better about it, even though she was sick. And there she lay. She had nothing now. No material goods, no anything. Naked she came into this world, and naked she returned. But let me tell you something. My mom went to God. And I remember, I just remember when it, it was it, and I saw her go. She had a tear and a smile on her face, and I'll never forget reaching up and trying to grab the soul of her, or touch the soul as she left her body. And I, I knew she and where she went. And she let, she was saying things like, she, she actually she actually thanked me for leading her to Christ Amen. and baptizing her. And I saw her go home to the Lord. And I'm going to see her again. That's my mom. And thank God for my mom. I'll tell you, if you've never thanked your mom before, even if your mom wasn't a good mom, at least you're in the world, and at least you know the Lord. Amen. It's yes. time to look and say, thank you, Mom. Thank you. Amen. Because you brought me to a place, and you know what? I can never go back from it. 
My mom was a beautiful woman. She was a class act. And I love her. I didn't love her. I love her. You get what I'm saying? Why? Because my God is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He's not a God of the dead, but of the living. And my mother is alive somewhere. And I know. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the time. I thank you, Lord God, for the, even the emotions. I thank you, Lord Father, for teaching us. I thank you, Lord God, for being a mother to us and, and edifying us. I thank you, Lord, for that gospel was preached to us. I thank you, Lord God, that you put mothers in our lives, and my mother was the mother of my living. I thank you for it, Lord Father. I thank you for my whole family, and I thank you for my extended family. I thank you, Lord, that you made me a pastor here, and sometimes I have to mother people. And I thank you, Lord, for this congregation that has mothered me. And I thank you for my wife, who's a good mother, who turned into something very, very much a, a woman of God. And I thank you for it, Lord. She's a good wife. She's a good mother. She's a good prayer. And I thank you, and I, I lift her up to you, Lord, and I say thank you for her that thou gave her to me. Thank you, Lord, for my mom, who thou hast given to me. Thank you, Lord, for the mothers in here. Thank you for Yvonne being a, a good mother. She has mothered me at times. And thank you for Rose, who has brought her kids up. And she's gotten a sweetheart in a, in a matter of a, a just a few months, Lord Father. And, and thank you for Miss Adrienne being a mother. Thank you for her children, Lord God, and her grandchildren. Uh, thank you, Lord Father. For Miss Roxanne, and thank you for her being a good mother. Thank you for Mallory coming in here. Thank you for her children that have gotten saved. Thank you, Lord, for Rochelle that come in here. And thank you for her children. And thank you, Lord, that she took the importance on it to make sure her children were saved. Thank you for Julie. And thank you for her children. Thank you, Lord, that she allowed us in her life. And thank you, Lord, that her children have gotten saved through the prayers of her and the prayers of other mothers that have come before her, Lord Father. And thank you for Mickey, her mother, Lord God, that brought her up that sooner or later she came to you, Lord Father. And I thank you for uh, Miss Wanda and, and her being a mother, Lord Father. And I thank you, Lord God, that she speaks of the things of thee, Lord Father. I pray that her children would someday speak of the things of thee, Lord Father. And I thank you, Lord, for anyone I've missed, any mother, uh, Mary, Lord Father, and her family. And her mothering, and her mothering to me at times, Lord Father, and even Donna that comes in, and, and her mothering, and her mothering to, to in, in our lifetime. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come in. Thank you for my wife's mother. I thank you, Lord, for the mothers, and thank you for Mother's Day. I thank you in all things, and I love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, that's enough.